Gentlemen, welcome back to the room formerly known as the Wife Sewing. Today we are having a look at a staple of industry, a Lego brick, if you will. Behold, the mighty pressure transducer. Now, transducer, not only a great word, what for bandying around to impress your non-dork friends, it, it's also an actual thing. It encompasses a lot, a lot of devices because a transducer is simply a device that changes one form of energy into another, one form of signal into another. So a speaker, a simple speaker, that is a transducer because it takes electrical impulses, changes them into acoustical impulses. Now these specific transducers are pressure transducers. They take a, a pressure signal, either a gas or a liquid pressure signal of a certain range and output a voltage signal of a certain range. So we can see here, this one inputs 600 PSI gauge and it will output 0 0.5 volts to 5.5 volts depending on the pressure. So full scale 600 PSI on the input would output 5.5 volts. How it does that is it has a Wheatstone bridge and a sensing element and best way to explain it is to draw you a picture. Here's the schematicized innards of the Wheatstone bridge. Essentially what we have in a, a half, no, in a quarter bridge situation. Quarter bridge just means that there's one sensing element and it could be a half bridge in which case there would be two sensing elements. So here we have known resistances, very, very accurate, uh, very precise and accurate. And then we have a piezo-resistive sensing element. And what this does is it changes its resistance depending on how it's bent. Okay, so we have oil coming in here through the quarter-inch NPT fitting, acting on a pistone. The pistone acts on the piezo-resistive sensing element. This would be a thin film, just a little tiny wafer thin with, uh, thing with some sort of resistive element, either... Uh, you know, just a, a micron thin layer of, of some sort of conductor that changes the resistance depending on how you bend it. So we got nine volts in and then what we're doing is the output is actually in the middle of this and this is what's going out of these pins. So at resting, no pressure on the piston, we get 0 0.5 volts out. That is what they call a live zero why would you not have it at if it's off you know there's nothing on it why wouldn't you have it at zero volts well that's an extra little bit of information that that can give us if it's zero volts we actually know that something in here is fucked it's broken so we have that live 0 0.5 volts so that on the tail end when we're reading that we know that this system is still intact it's a very clever little trick to know that there's not a broken wire somewhere. As we apply pressure, it makes this piezo-resistive element bend more and more, and the voltage goes up. So we're all the way up, in this case, to 5.5 volts full scale, which would be 600 PSI gauge. Now the beauty part about these, partner, is that they're the first casualty of the parts cannon when someone is engaging in overpaid guesswork. They will replace these, say something's not working. <laughs> They'll, it must be the transducer. They'll replace these and lo and behold, it doesn't fix the problem. So now what happens if, is we have this sitting on the bench, good used stock. So you go in an industrial environment, you go to the storekeeper and he'll tell you, the warehouseman, and you'll say, hey, this is good use. Can you put this back on the shelf? And he'll say, fuck no, <laughs> go and throw it away. Because nobody is going to spend it like it's just stupid to have good used parts. Because you don't really know if they're good or not. So what happens is an old gray beard will squirrel this away in the bottom drawer of his toolbox. We have a look at the field revised data sheet here. Focus, you fuck. Uh, too shiny. And we see the output is 5.5 volts. Input, 9 to 30 volts DC. That's great. 9 volts DC? That's a battery. So I simply added a, a little 9 volt battery clip into the 
red and the black, of course, positive and negative. And then the signal wire also needs the same neg off the battery. So we've broken that out into the two wires here. So signal and ground. And then we'll just go ahead and clean that up. Get the soldering iron out, solder it all up. Now we got our DMM or digital multimeter hooked up and we're showing zero volts. We know there's a problem. At zero PSI gauge, we should have 0.5 volts. What's the problem? A fucking course, I don't have a 9 volt battery. Yeah, jackpot. Always good to have 9 volt batteries around because most of the meters take them. Of course, do as I say, not as I do. Now, in most, in, in mixed circles, we would say that's Robin Peter to pay Paul. Or it's just us girls in the shop here. Jerking off the dog to feed the cat. Ah, sick. Okay, here we go. We can see at, we're pretty close there. We're pretty close. Five volts out of it at zero PSI gauge. Typically, a human doing can develop right around 15 PSI. I could ever get this red hat off. Fuck us. There we go. So we'll, uh, we're getting a little bit of drift here already. Might be because the battery's deader than a doornail. Uh, helps if you have your meter on the right scale. Oh, for fuck. <laughs> it just doesn't end. Yeah, freshy. The wife's holding out on me. Can't say as I blame her. Must be good. It's an industrial. I don't know what she's using that for, but it was in her bedside table. As I was saying, if memory serves, the typical human doing can output 15 PSI. So the difference there was 15 millivolts and I went through some handy dandy calculations. The delta between zero and full scale is 5 volts. So 5.5 volts according to the data sheet here minus the 5. You get it. It's 5 volts. Now 5 volts divided by 600 PSI is, oh somebody didn't do his uh, dimensional analysis. So uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. So that is 0 0.0083 volts per PSI. So 100 PSI is going to be 833 plus that uh, zero, that live zero. So 100 PSI is going to be 1.333 volts. 250 PSI is 0 0.257 volts. Now, as we saw, the delta was 15 millivolts. So that's What's 15 into 83 is uh, 5 point something. So 5 point something PSI. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, I, I'm resigned to the fact that I don't run unless somebody's chasing me. And it's, it's been a long time since somebody chased me. But 5 PSI seems a little low on the old uh, volumetric capacity there. Better have another cigarette. Wah. We're back in the greasy old shop. And... As Confucius say, there are many ways to skin a cat. I just want to point out that knowing that the world is made up of Lego makes you so much more versatile. Because, well, what you could do, okay, say we wanted to, here's, here's the scenario. We want to measure the pressure of the air going into this impact gun. We want to measure that. Now, we could call a system in, if you're in industry, you could call a system integrator, toss to 10 grand and, and three months to get you a solution to log the data coming out of this airline. Okay. Now, when you are troubleshooting hydraulic problems, you think troubleshooting electrical problems is hard? Hydraulic is even harder because you're dealing with electronics. You're dealing with schmoo being in the system. Maybe there's a chunk of schmoo in there. Maybe a lot of times it's an operator problem. And the only way you can pinpoint those is if you are logging the pressure and flow data. In this case, we're only logging the pressure data of this system. But this is an incredibly powerful tool. And this is the cheapest and easiest way to do it. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. You could call up Fluke. You could get a, a pressure logging gauge. Um, probably cost you four grand landed. This, my friends, you keep this in your toolbox, you're going to look like a fucking genius when you come across an intermittent problem 
on a, a pneumatic or air system. So what we have is we have this cheap little pressure transducer, 100 bucks. 100 bucks will get you in the door. Chances are, if you work in industry, they got the lying around by the gross. Good used. Hey, okay? good used. Now, what I have is a Bluetooth logging multimeter. This is just an El Cheapo, straight from the Big Rock Candy Mountain. So we can see overall the idea, but it's not granular enough to get the, the impulses to the motor itself, which is what I was hoping for. So this doesn't update quick enough. This would be good for a long term. Well, actually, you could set it on min max as well. So you could see pressure spikes, that sort of thing. But we're not seeing the kind of granularity that we really want to get into. In order to do that, what we can do is hook this up to the Asmeloscope. Here's another transducer that I found in my bag of tricks. I actually set this one up for uh, carrying around away missions and so forth. It runs on uh, four to six volts. So what I've done is just three batteries and then shorted this one out so we get four and a half volts. And, and I've soldered in some leads here. And what those are good for is connecting up either to your meter or in this case your oscilloscope. The setup here is we're going to use these transducers, one 10,000 PSI and one 600 PSI, one in the airline, 600, 10,000 in the oil line. We're going to see the impulses of the impact and we're also going to see the pressure drops as the vanes in the air motor whip past. That'll give us a clearer picture of what is going on with this mechanical system. Okay, and we've got it set at 500 milliseconds per square. So that'll give us uh, right around 5 seconds. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 6 seconds of data. And we've got it at 200 millivolts. Quite a bit of noise. But as we can see, we're sweeping past here. So we're going to see what happens when we hit the gun. Yellow is channel one, it is the hydraulic pressure, and blue, channel two, is the air pressure. You see there's some noise here from something or other, there's little pulses, let's just ignore that. And there's the pressure, that's steady. Now we'll go over here to when we're actually starting to hammer. We can see the veins fly by, so slight pressure spikes here and drops that same noise but on the hydraulic side we're not seeing any impulses from that actual hammer goes up pretty steady but we're not seeing any actual blips so what is going on here very clearly illustrated in the scope shot is that we are accurately measuring the clamping load on this cylinder because it's ramping up nice and smoothly, it's actually attenuating, that is, it's damping the impacts from this impact gun. Now that illustrates there is some definite marketing wank going on when they test impact guns, this breakaway torque. In the test that we see in YouTube, he is using inch and a quarter, inch and a quarter, very rigid, very short, with perfect washers, perfect nut, new grease every time. So this, you got to take this with a grain of salt. Because that breakaway torque rating only works with that fastener combination. When are you ever going to pull out a half inch gun to drive an inch and a quarter nut? two inch across the flats with a half inch drive. I say that again, two inch across the flats, two inch socket with a half inch drive. When the fuck are you ever going to have something like that? You're not. So if you test it with a different fastener combination, say a three quarter fastener, you will get a lower torque rating because there is some 
twist, some, some harmonics going on there, some dampening and some spring action going on in the fastener. Granted, I'm a bit of a contrarian. It gets my fucking Jimmy's Russell because this is argument by authority. You know, I'm, I'm so uh, Dr. Richard Head, PhD, M-A-L-A-K-A, and I say this is what works, and look at this. I have all this gear to prove it. That fucking gear is not designed to measure the torque of impact guns. It's measured to, to, to measure, it's designed rather, <laughs> I'm all fucking, I'm all rattled. It's designed to measure the tension on bolts and the fact that he uses the stiffest bolt in there, what possibly can, is, is, is telling me that he is trying to get the highest torque number out of there that he possibly can. Now, what's really telling is when he uses the proper tool, later on, he uses the proper tool, the torque rating is far lower. And that proper tool is a Skidmore uh, Type T. I just so happened, I, I found some information here online. Very telling. When using the digital torque meter to make comparison between tester results and job specs, it's important to understand the nature of tightening fasteners with impact wrenches. Impact wrenches are not torque tools, but rather impulse devices. Impulse, blah, blah, blah. The effectiveness of an impulse is directly related to the nature of the struck mass. And in fact, the wrench, the socket, the fastener, and the joint become a large system. The net result is that unless the joint conditions are the same as the test conditions, torque values from a testing device will not be the same as the job torque requirements. What they are saying is lab results are gonna to be totally different than field results because lab results, brand new nuts, no oxidation, grease, you know, nicely polished for maximum wow factor. On the job, you will never in a million fucking years get a thousand foot pounds out of one of these guns. Uh, yeah, so uh, end rant bracket. That is how we can go ahead and use in the field, just make up a little power supply, DC power supply with batteries, and we can use any of these transducers. Now, this outputs this outputs uh, voltage and other ones output 4 to 20 milliamps. It's a little more complicated. I will go over that in a future video, how to connect that up. Maybe what we'll do is we'll connect it up to an Arduino and we can do data logging uh, with an Arduino and one of these things. Yeah, Lego part of industry. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice.